Please pray with me. Abba, God is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Abba God forever. Amen. Please be seated. When I was first Christian, I was given the clear idea that being a Christian meant that I would be nice and that people would like me because I was so nice. You're laughing. There's too much laughter coming, <laughs> coming from over here. Don't worry. I know. I'm not, I'm not necessarily like a... I don't think that's the adjective people use to describe me. Usually it's intense or passionate or way too into theology. You know, so it's stuff like that. Anyway, so I had this idea because I was nice, people would like me. I would be more popular with people because I'd be kind and patient and happy, happy all the time, no worries, right? I would be compliant and non-obtrusive. That should solicit a chuckle, okay? <laughs> Sorry. I, compliance and being non-obtrusive, that's not really me either. That I would be meek and mild. Okay, <laughs> I would be all things to all people in a very non-offensive and non-confrontational way. In fact, being offensive and confrontational were sort of told to me that it would be, uh, or being the opposite of any of the adjectives that I've listed thus far, would be synonymous with being not a Christian. Okay, there was a binary being formed early in this young, um, new Christian mind. Okay, so if you're following the logic, it looked like this to me. Happy person means Christian, equals Christian. And then that, that means grumpy person means not Christian. Okay, you're really grumpy. Maybe you need Jesus. Okay, because a Christian would never be grumpy or upset or sad or mean at all, right? But to be honest, and after a, a bunch of years studying the Bible and theology, I don't know where this idea comes from. It actually kind of escapes me. It's not in the Bible, really, okay? Yes, Paul says to rejoice and rejoice again, and we get those wonderful adjectives, you know, in Corinthians, and we get some of them again in Galatians, um, talking about what love is and what, how we're supposed to be in the world. But this, but this idea doesn't really form itself um, in Paul. And Jesus does say not to worry, right? Don't like the lilies of the field who are clothed beautifully. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. You know, like the birds who get food. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, right? So there's that as well. And there are exhortations to love your neighbor and offer up service to them in the name and to the glory of God. Then there are some Pauline and some pseudo Pauline, meaning some of our letters probably written in the style of Paul, then not necessarily strictly written by Paul, okay? That there's references to being good, compliant, and prayerful citizens, okay? But those are few and far between, okay? We make a big deal of them. You would think that it's everywhere, but it's not. It's just kind of decorates, kind of peppered in, all right? Um, but it's not, it's really not a biblical idea. But in general, the Christian life is not particularly described as nice, happy, kind, or compliant. That's not really what you get when you're diving into the Gospels or reading about Jesus's life or even being influenced by Paul. To be even more honest, I'm not sold on the idea that those we are exhorted to imitate were all that nice or happy. Okay? For instance, while Paul brought the gospel proclamation, God's word of comfort and love to many, he was a force to be reckoned to reckon with. Okay, a force to be reckoned with and very open about his suffering while bringing glory to God and God's beloved. Paul does talk about a thorn in his side that he can't get rid of. Okay, his letters are fraught with deep spiritual joy and material pain. Okay, there's, there's that, 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 that paradox is going on throughout all of his letters. All right, Jesus, God's own child, right? The incarnate word of God who identified with the oppressed and marginalized was quite offensive and confrontational, okay, towards many. How else do you think he ended up on the cross, a state instrument of death, right? We do have the spiritual component of why Jesus is there, but there's the material component as well. The authorities, all of them, were kind of threatened, you know? And we like to think that we, we talk about WWJD, right? You know what that stands for? What would Jesus do, right? How many people go around flipping tables? 
Jesus did that, right? We need an ethic of flipping tables, all right? So Jesus had no problem being very offensive to people who were being oppressive, right? So this idea that I would be, by being a new Christian, I would just be this like ray of sunshine in everyone's life just kind of doesn't, it misses the mark, okay? That's, that's what harmatas means, to miss the mark, right? Um, it's, it's sin, in other words. So the reality um, is that the Christian life will actually bring us into direct conflict with both religious and civil authorities. If you really want to know what the book of Acts is about, it's about the spirit on the move. It's tossing tables, okay? But through the disciples, okay? It's where the disciples now who have been vested with the message of Christ, all right, given the message of Christ, are now going to be in the world flipping tables. The world is on the process of being made right side up from being upside down, okay? So following, for us to follow in the steps of Christ as Christ's disciples means that, like Christ, we will find ourselves confronting the false idols of our age, exposing decrepit and toxic systems, and coming face to face with structural violence that is intending to do harm to God's beloved. In other words, no, not everyone is going to like us, okay? Or think we're so peachy keen or nice. If that is hard to believe, Let's turn to the Luke story in Acts about Peter in full-on confrontation with the religious authorities, okay? Um, so now it happened that the rulers and the elders and the scribes of Israel were convened in Jerusalem, both Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and as many who were of the kin of the high priest, they were all there. And after standing the prisoners in the middle of them, they were learning by inquiry, the rulers and the leaders were learning by inquiry, by what power and whose name did you, you do this thing? Then Peter, by means of being filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, there's an ellipsis there. Our lectionary drops us off with Peter and John as prisoners before the elders and rulers of the people of Israel in Jerusalem. But how did they get there? Okay, so the lectionary gives you really good ideas of what's going on in the text, but sometimes you have to dial it back a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do real quick. Quick. Okay, so last week we saw Peter and John heal a man who needed healing his whole life. Okay, um, and then in response to this healing, we saw that the people of Israel were amazed and awed and shocked at this, and they all gathered and swarmed to see what Peter and John had done for this man. So as, as these people gather around John and Peter, Peter begins to address the crowd with words of exposure and comfort in the proclamation of Christ raised from the dead. Okay, now this proclamation, this public proclamation was done in a way that caused some of the leaders of the temple to go, whoa, whoa, what? What's going on here? And come and pursue Peter and John. So as a result, some Sadducees and the captain of the temple approach Peter and John and arrest them for proclaiming Jesus's resurrection from the dead to the people. The proclamation of Jesus being raised from the dead got Peter and John arrested socially in the political realm, okay? So there they, there they are. So now this is where we pick up. So now in our passage, it makes more sense. Peter and John are carted out into the middle of this convened, the, the, the scholars think it wasn't the Sanhedrin, but I'm gonna use that word because that word sounds like it is the Sanhedrin, okay? The council, the authorities, everyone related to the high priest, okay? All of these people gathered. So now we're situated in a trial. Okay, that's what you're supposed to be imagining. Peter and John standing amongst all these rulers and leaders of the people of Israel, all right? And now they have to give account, all right? So as Luke tells us, Peter and John are dragged out into the middle of all these leaders of Israel so that they, the rulers and elders, can interrogate John and Peter and find out by what power or in whose name did you, you do this thing. That W there means that in the Greek, the, 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 the second person plural is showing up alongside with the verb which contains the pronoun, pronoun number, okay? So, in English, we just have walk, talk, you know? But in Greek, you have the, the you, the he, the it, the she, the them. They're all embedded in the verbs. You don't need the, the personal pronouns at all, but when they show up, they do something. And it means that these 
you've got to imagine, what did you, you do, and whose name? They're mad. It's emphasis, okay? So when you see that personal pronoun show up next to the verb or alongside in the same sentence, there's, you want emotion. You want emotion coming up out of that translation, okay? So Peter has a choice here. Uh, he could just say something ambiguous about God. Well, I just did it in the name of God and that's it, okay? But, but, he, but he doesn't, okay? Instead, Luke tells us, Peter being filled by the Holy Spirit said to them, okay, the Spirit of God inspires and emboldens Peter to speak light to darkness okay, in this moment, all right, to expose the errors of judgment and the missed mark, okay? It's the following speech about divine liberating action of the oppressed that gets Peter and John in trouble with those who are in power. Regular words about an ambiguous God or divine figure are rarely offensive. They don't solicit raised eyebrows or provoke to anger. They're kind of banal, right? Like you just kind of, you don't feel that altered. It's just you know, kind of banal, right? Rather, it is the words demonstrating God as against those in power that will provoke to anger, okay? So Peter and John knew this would be the case. Why? Who else received anger at the proclamation of his message and the actions that he did? Jesus, right? And the disciples are following after. Peter and John know that this is what's, what's going to happen, okay? And they saw Jesus die because of it. And they were fully aware that death would come for them too, okay, in this proclamation. So Peter, being filled with the Spirit, boldly declares to the leaders of Israel, and not just to a crowd of bystanders, right? So now, see the movement. that They've gone from this public Protest, like proclamation, now to this private inner sanctum proclamation. Now Peter is moving not just from talking to people like you and me, all right, but to like, imagine like storming into the bishop's office and be like, I've got some words to say to you, right? Like now Peter is before the people he's supposed to revere and fear, okay? So he says this, if we, we, again, you got that double we, right, are being interrogated about the well-doing of a weak person by what this man has been saved, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you, you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This man has stood in your presence as healthy by that name. You get chills? Okay. Peter's words shatter glass walls that were separating the religious and the political. All of that crumbles to the ground here. What they proclaim to the people, they now proclaim to the leaders. Liberation from oppression comes to liberate the oppressed and also the oppressor. So know that in, in this, another, this second proclamation of Christ crucified and raised, those words are meant to liberate not just the people who are being oppressed, but also the oppressor. That's, who, that's to whom Peter is speaking. Okay, as a result, Peter and John are treated as criminals who thwart the law and break the social arrangement. Okay, and I'm going to quote from Willie James Jennings. He writes a great commentary on Acts. He says this about Acts 4, real preaching and authentic teaching is inextricably bound to real criminality. You're going to get in trouble if you're allowing divine words to expose broken systems. You're going to get in trouble. But something else is going on here. This scene is meant to demonstrate the power of the judges over the judge. Think of the, that, that whole movement. They bring Peter and John. There's a tribunal of people, right? They're accusing. You tell us where you get the power to do this thing or whose name, right? But a reversal is happening with this little speech from Peter. A great big, you should just hear it like a divine, like, like just creaking on a hinge, the tables are turning, okay? So rather than the judges asking the questions of the judge, Peter, the judged, turns the table, and now the rulers and elders of the people of Israel are the ones being questioned, okay? In one swift and divinely inspired word, Peter puts these judges on trial, okay? They are now the guilty ones who have to account for themselves. 
all right? They are the exposed ones. They are now the ones who must justify their power. I did it in the name of Jesus Christ, the one God raised to the dead, the one you crucified, Peter says. Where do you get your power from, is the question. The rulers must declare in whose name they act. And things become a bit trickier when Peter makes it clear that he and his friends are the representatives of God, therefore implying you, you rulers and elders of Israel are not, not anymore. In and through Peter's speech, the world is exposed as upside down. Peter and John are caught up in the divine activity as they participate in turning it right side up according to divine love, life, and liberation in the name of God for God's beloved. All right? So Acts reminds us, don't worry, I'm concluding. From beginning to end, from the very first chapter to the very last one, that the life of a Christian and the life of the Christian church is one that is hard and not easy. Okay? Okay? To follow Christ demands that we, like all his disciples, i.e. Peter and John, will become caught up in the waterfall of divine justice for the beloved that is life, love, and liberation. And this necessity means that we will not be nice, not all the time. Sometimes, yes, but definitely not all the time. Okay, we will be confrontational at times. We may even be offensive, especially to those who are benefiting being nestled comfortably in the power of an upside-down world. Okay, again, recourse to Willie James Jennings. The great illusion of followers of Jesus, especially those who imagine themselves leaders, is that they could live a path different from Jesus and his disciples. They believe somehow that they can be loved or at least liked or at least tolerated or even ignored by those with real power in the world. It's not what the Bible tells us. God loves you and you are wonderful and marvelous and a huge blessing and an absolute miracle. Absolutely, those are all good words. But not everyone's going to think that, all right? Easter tells us that not only is our past tied up with Christ, death, and resurrection, but so is our future. And if both our past and future are tied up with Christ, it means that our present is as well. Remember, you don't have a present tense if you don't have a past and a future. So if you tie up the past and the future in Christ, that means like a not the middle part, the present, is also tied up with it. All right? To live into the gift of resurrected life means being led by the Spirit to participate in the divine revolution of love in the world on behalf of God's beloved. Many will be grateful. Do not get me wrong. Many people are grateful for liberation. Many more will not be grateful because liberation means that the oppressor is losing power. Okay? The Christian walk is hard, not because we have to be pious or self-righteous or force ourselves to be perfect and better than everyone else. It's hard because to love your neighbor in the name of God, it's hard. In her most systematic thinking, thinking about God, my favorite and yours, Dorothy Zola, writes this. Love has its price. The cross expresses love to the endangered, threatened life of God in our world. It is no longer a question of biophilic embracing of life which spares itself the cross. The more we love God, the threatened, endangered, crucified God, the nearer we are to God, the more endangered we are ourselves. The message of Jesus is that the more you grow in love, the more vulnerable you make yourself. It is hard to be a soft-shell crab in this world. Okay? So, beloved, to love is hard because it's risky. Okay? God knows because God loves and risks everything for you, God's very precious beloved. 